Okay. Hi everyone and welcome to the final exam review number one. We're going through topics one through four. I put that in my email. So um, I'm not gonna list off everything in topics one through four, we'll see them. So these are my memes. If you're watching the recording, feel free to pause and look at the memes. Um, oh, Melissa's here too, just for the recording. <laughs> um, so we're gonna start off with amino acids, level of protein structure, et cetera. Um, these are my memes, enjoy my memes. Did everyone enjoy them? Can I move on? Do we enjoy them? Uh, okay. Um, so starting with the polypeptide anatomy. Okay, so we're starting with the polypeptide. And if you remember the polypeptide is the first kind of structure, what we start off with the protein. Polypeptides are made of amino acids. So each of these are the, the breakup is at the peptide bond, which we will go over. So everything, each, each one of these is an amino acid. Um, we label N terminus to C terminus. Your M terminus is your amino group and your C terminus is your carboxyl group. Um, and then the R groups are arranged by chemistry and size. And we will definitely get more into R groups. Also at any point, um, please feel free to ask any questions. I will try to monitor the chat, but no promises to my people on Zoom. Um, protein structure levels. So our primary structure is our sequence of amino acids. This is the main structure with the exception of disulfide bonds that have covalent bonds. These covalent bonds are linked or are called um, peptide bonds. They're between the amino group of one amino acid or amine group, I didn't say an amino, I'm sorry. Amine group of one amino acid and the carboxyl group of another. So you're always gonna find a peptide bond between an N and a C, where you have the carboxyl and the amine. So um, these are really, really strong and really hard to break. Um, so you need enzymatic activity to break these versus what we're gonna get into non-covalent bonds, which you can break a little more easily. So you're almost never gonna, not gonna say that. It's very, very hard to break primary structure and um, break the peptide bonds. Um, and we'll get into why that is relevant um, when we get to the other structures or levels. Um, then we have secondary structure. Our secondary structure is mainly hydrogen bonds. And this structure is between backbone atoms and they form alpha helices which look like helixes and beta sheets. So the alpha helix is the top one and the beta sheet is the bottom one. So uh, the bonding is between the amino groups and the carboxyl acid groups or carboxyl groups. Um, like I said, that's the backbone, um, but it is not, it's hydrogen bond. So it's not between the C and the N obviously because we need okay, hydrogen for hydrogen bond. Um, so these are non-covalent, so easier to break. Um, for alpha helix, our R groups are on the outside, which makes sense, because imagine we have one of those big R groups, like lysine. Um, on the inside, that would not be very stable for an alpha helix. Um, it, it just is too big to me on the inside. And beta sheets alternate up and down, so on the top, on the bottom. So you can see here, R group, R group, R group, R group. Um, and the secondary structure does not include the R groups. So I know that R group interactions are really hard for a lot of people, and that's, that's a big one. That is not secondary structure. It is tertiary structure. <laughs> Sorry, Melissa just whispered tertiary <laughs> structure like she was spoiling the question. <laughs> um, so your tertiary structure is your overall 3D um, shape of one single polypeptide chain. And it's important to know it's a single polypeptide chain because that is how it differs from quaternary structure. So these are your interactions between your R group. You have your hydrophobic or van der Waals, um, ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, and then the one covalent bond is a disulfide bond. And that only happens between cysteines because cysteines have sulfurs. Um, in order of weakest to strongest, your weakest is gonna be your van der Waals, 
then your hydrogen, then your ionic, and then your disulfide is covalent, so that is the strongest. So quaternary structure is when you have two subunits. So a big question that throws a lot of people off is subunits versus domains. One subunit is one polypeptide. So one folded polypeptide is a subunit. Quaternary structure has multiple subunits versus a domain is a part of a protein or part of a polypeptide chain the way it's folded that serves the same function in multiple different proteins. So there's some sort of folding and interactions that happen, and you can find that across several different proteins and it serves the same function. So that's within a polypeptide chain. So subunit, single polypeptide can come together and form a quaternary structure, a bigger protein. Um, domain is just a particular part of a protein that serves a specific function. I know that's not on the slides, but I get that question a lot. Okay, I reiterated this multiple times. Um, the tertiary is a single polypeptide chain. Quaternary is multiple polypeptide chains, also referred to as subunits. Um, and they're stabilized by the covalent and non-covalent. The only covalent bond involved is disulfide. This is a pretty schematic. Oh, wow, I am ahead of my own slides. Um, so this is what I was saying about the domain. Um, so it says it's a section of a protein that folds independently. Um, I think that just means that it's, it's always folding the way it does. It's, the protein's not gonna change the domain because the domain is always folding. The same way, because form equals function. So the form has to be the same for the function to be the same. Um, and then the subunit is just, um, quaternary structure or subunits come together to make a quaternary structure. So tertiary structure is one person. Subunits, two subunits would be quaternary if this helps you visualize better. Um, and each person represents a polypeptide. Um, you can also think of it as a train, like just the single train. Um, and so these are good for, if you wanna look back at the slides, uh, saying the domains might be the wheels. So while there's multiple subunits, they all have wheels. And in this case, all the wheels are doing the same thing. So the wheels would be a domain. Um, and now we'll get into our group interactions, bonds and more amino acid stuff. Ah, funny meme. Okay, thanks guys. So polar versus nonpolar. So we're getting into a little bit more of the chemistry. Polar is the uneven sharing of electrons. So this is looking at electronegativity. I don't know if anyone remembers chemistry, but if you look at a periodic table, a periodic table, fluorine is in the top. Fluorine is the most electronegative, and then it goes diagonally down. So Molecules with high electronegativity are going to be your fluorine, your oxygen, your nitrogen, your sulfur, versus hydrogen, which has a very low electronegativity. Um, so the uneven sharing of electrons, if you look at this, just means that the electrons are going to be spending more time around the oxygen because it's electronegative, meaning that it loves electrons, um, versus the hydrogen, which causes the oxygen to be partially negative. It is not fully negative. It doesn't have an extra electron making it negative. It's just partially negative because the electrons hang out there more because electrons are always moving in space. Versus nonpolar means the electrons are evenly dis distributed, 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 English. Um, across the molecule, they are usually symmetrical um, and there's the same charge across the molecule. So in this case, there are dipole interactions. So there are more negative or more electrons hanging out around here, but because it's symmetrical and they're pulling evenly in all directions, the charge doesn't go to one place. So there's no dipole. It's not polar because there's not uneven charge. Um, for example, a C and an H bond is nonpolar because C and H, while C is closer to like oxygen and stuff, um, they are both, have such close electronegativities that uh, they share electrons evenly. Um, so like CNH is not um, symmetrical 
but because of the similar electronegativity, it is still nonpolar. So now we have our types of R group interactions. So this is going from strongest to weakest. Um, our strongest non covalent bond is ionic bonds. And those are formed between polar charged R groups. Um, so that's like saying a lysine because it's positively charged and an aspartic acid is negatively charged. We know opposites attract. That phrase did not come from relationships. It actually came from chemistry. Um, so your negative charge and your positive charge are gonna attract and make ionic bonds. Piece of advice for the exam. Um, I know that we had some issues with printing last time and people thought that the positive was a negative because it looked negative. Look at your amino acid chart. If it's lysine, whether it looks like a negative, it's always gonna be a positive unless directly stated. The pictures don't print very well, okay? Um, because some people were getting questions wrong. Um, one of, I don't remember which exam it was. Um, so yeah, you get this chart, so use it. Um, your polar uncharged R groups, which are your blue, will typically make hydrogen bonds um, because they're hydrophilic. Hydrophilic is not interchangeable with polar, but hydrophilic usually also means polar. They're also polar as well as hydrophilic. Um, and you get CO, CN, OH, um, NH bonds because involved in those because of the difference in electronegativity. Um, I will say that polar charged R groups and polar uncharged R groups can also make hydrogen bonds because if you look at, say, arginine, there's an NH group that has a plus, NH2 plus. There's also an NH2 group that does not have a charge on it, which means it can hydrogen bond with a polar group. Does that make sense? Just because it's charged doesn't mean it can only make ionic bonds. It can also make hydrogen bonds just not with the atoms that are charged. Um, Nonpolar R groups, which are our yellows, do not have a very strong change in electronegativity. So they're hydrophobic, lots of C's and H's. Um, they're weak, the weakest of the interactions. Um, we call them van der Waals interactions in this class, uh, London dispersion forces, interstatic uh, or electrostatic interactions. You'll hear all of that. Or, yeah, you'll hear a lot of different uh, names for that um, because of the similar electronegativity. Nonpolar R groups, whether they're next to polar or charged, say we're changing an amino acid, cannot make any other interactions. Okay, so say you switch an alanine with an or an aspartic acid with an alanine, that's automatically taking away the ionic bond that it might be making, and it's going to make van der Waals instead because. That's just what nonpolars do. Um, cysteine makes uh, disulfide bridges, disulfide bonds because it has the sulfur, sulfur, but they only make them with each other. Um, and also cysteine is one of the amino acids that sometimes they fight to put in polar because this is a spectrum, not all polar and nonpolars are created equal. Um, SH does have a difference in electronegativity, so it's kind of a cusp. Um, but the reason it's different, say, from serine, which uh, has the OH, is because there is more of an electro difference in electronegativity between O and H than S and H. I'm not sure if this class has have you done that question, because we've had that question on. I think we had that question on an exam of comparing cysteine. And serine, OH, more electronegative difference than SH. Um, I would just know that. Like I said, the exam has not been made yet, but that was on our year's exam. So um, any questions? I know I just talked a lot. Any questions? Yeah. Okay, so I said to note, I do not know if this is going to be on any exam or anything, but note that cysteine is a cusp Sometimes people disagree whether it's polar or nonpolar because S and H do have a difference of electronegativity. It, however, is less than the difference of electronegativity between O and H, which is why serine is more polar than cysteine. 
to that be good? Okay. Any questions in chat? Okay. Any other questions on this? Okay. So these interactions are going to be both in quaternary or tertiary and quaternary structure. Anything you do in tertiary structure, you can also do in quaternary structure. Um, this is kind of just a little chart that could kind of help you. I'm going to send out these slides to everyone. So um, this might help you kind of organize things. I also like, I don't think I included it here, but I also think that it's really, really good to practice by making a chart and put primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, write down what kind of bonds are made in each. So covalent, non-covalent, covalent and non-covalent. Secondary we know is hydrogen. So say we mess up a hydrogen bond, which levels of structure can that affect? I'm asking an actual question. And quaternary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. But if I mess up an ionic bond, which level of structures can that affect? Only tertiary and quaternary because the ionic bonds are not involved in secondary structure. Um, so that would be helpful to know. Um, and then disulfide bonds, only between cysteines. They're very stable, used to stabilize tertiary and quaternary, um, only covalent. So it's the strongest. Here's our bond summary. I'm not gonna beat you over the head with it because I just did. Um, before I move on from the bonds, any questions at all on anything regarding the bonds? Anything from Zoom? Okay. Then we will move on to protein folding. So we start off with a peptide and then we end up with a beautiful protein um, that looks the way it's supposed to every time. So how do we do that? That's not, okay. I guess we only have one slide for protein folding. So um, the hydrophobic effect is the tendency of nonpolar or also known hydrophobic, hydrophobic, figure of water, um, amino acid or R groups to end up on the inside because they want to get away from water because our cells are made up of what, um, the cytosol is mostly what? Water. So our nonpolar amino acids don't like water. So they go and they hide and a safe space is on the inside of the protein because the protein kind of folds in a way that it protects those. And then they all hang out. Um, the hydrophilic amino acids, which are polar, that are not scared of water, um, like to make bonds with other amino acids that are hydrophilic um, and they don't mind the water. So they will be found on the exterior. So if I gave you alanine, which is my favorite amino acid, is nonpolar. Are you going to find that on the inside or the outside of the protein? Inside, correct. Okay. Any questions on protein folding? Could everyone answer the question, if I mess this up and unfold the protein, what's going to happen to, if I break things and suddenly the R groups are exposed, what's going to happen? What's a great word? Starts with an A. They're all going to aggregate because if you expose the um, hydrophobic amino acids to the water, they're all going to clump together to try to get on the inside. And some are still going to be left on the outside and they're going to be really sad, but they're going to take advantage of each other. That's how I like to think of it. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, so it's protein folding. Yes. That is the egg question that if you add heat, the reason the egg turns white and this is quite upsetting to think about in reality, just the wording of it, is when you add an egg, you have your proteins, and then you heat them up, and they denature, right? And then all the nonpolar amino acids are suddenly exposed, and they aggregate, which then turns the egg solid. Um, so your egg is just clumps of amino acids, if that makes you feel better about life. That's my favorite question. And then if you add detergent, it's gonna break all the bonds and then the egg's gonna dissolve. Um, okay, protein modeling. This is my favorite meme. Do we get it? Because rippling my eye, you tough crowd. <laughs> okay, that made me happy. Okay, so ways to model proteins. I'm gonna go through this quickly because you're not gonna see much of this, I don't think. So we have our ball and stick 
or also known as wire or, or wire frame. They're not the same, but they're similar. So the ball would be the atom, the sticks would be the bonds. The wire frame obviously does not have balls. It is just the wire, so that would just be the bonds. So it shows all the covalent bonds, including backbone and R groups. Um, and then if there's the ball, then every atom in the protein is modeled, but you can't really tell the backbone from the R group. So um, like I said, the wire just depicts bonds without atoms. So that's a weakness uh, is that you can't discern the backbone from the R groups necessarily, but you do see every atom, R groups and backbone. Then we have our space fill. I'm gonna show pictures of this by the way. Then we have our space fill, which shows every atom and the space that it takes up. So this is really good for seeing the overall shape of a protein, um, like the cell surface of it. Um, but you can't really see the backbone of the protein in this case. Um, then we have the ribbon model, which is my personal favorite model. And it shows secondary structure. So it shows all of your alpha helices and beta sheets, but you cannot see the R groups. So it's just backbone and secondary structure, which is made of what kind of bonds? Hydrogen bonds, look at us, we are integrating our knowledge. Um, and then we have the backbone model, which shows only the backbone and not the R groups. Um, and it's kind of the skeleton where you just see the backbone. Um, and then you can overlap models if you want overlay, overlap models to see different characteristics. Um, so yeah, so here's some pictures. Oh. Yeah, and you should understand why maybe choosing one over another would be good. So if I wanted to look at our group interactions, I probably wouldn't do a backbone or a ribbon model because you can't see our groups in those. Does that make sense? Kind of those kinds of questions is what that's asking. Um, so here's a ball and stick. You can see your little balls and the sticks. And a lot of times they'll be in software where you can kind of move it around if anyone's played on OWL. Yeah, or go. Um, and then the ribbon model, you see the alpha helices and then there's some beta sheets. Um, sometimes you'll see arrows of the beta sheet or like the beta sheets look like arrows. I don't know why. Space fill, you can see all of these atoms in real time or in their real space, um, probably color coded for what they are. And then the backbone is just a sad little backbone all by itself. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that's it for protein models, protein structure modeling. Any questions on that? I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend all the time in the world on that one. Okay. And now Melissa is going to do KD and ligand. Okay. So this is focusing on protein ligand um, interactions and the affinity of those interactions. Um, so the ligand is any molecule that the protein is going to be binding to. Um, typically, this will have an impact on the functioning of the protein. This can be other proteins, ions, uh, vitamins, I think hormones as well. Um, the interactions don't necessarily have to happen within the binding pocket, and they can also happen on like the surface of the protein, but the binding pocket is sort of like a cavity, cavity within the protein that the um, ligand will fit into easily. Um, the binding site is facilitated by the specific amino acids that are there. The properties of the amino acid at the binding site um, allow for many non-covalent interactions to occur. So keep in mind all of these interactions between the amino acids and the ligand will be non-covalent interactions. Um, so, since, so if you look at the cyclic AMP here, this interaction between serine and serine is polar, so it creates a hydrogen bond with the ligand. Um, and so as the binding site relies on specific amino acid, um, ligand interactions, the orientation of the protein and the orientation of the specific ligand have to be correct because if they're orientated a little differently, then the interactions won't be able to occur. I'm sure you can check out the chat. Well, I, there was nothing in the chat. Which is okay. Um, and also, um, keep in mind that most interactions are random because realistically in the cell, the ligand and the proteins are just diffusing around the cytosol. So it relies on the ligand and the protein um, hitting each other at the right space within the cell. Um, so affinity is the strength of a protein ligand interaction. So depending on the properties of the ligand and the binding, binding site and the protein, they can have really strong affinity for each other and they're harder to break or and the bonds are harder to break, or they can have a lower affinity 
Um, so affinity is dependent upon the number of bonds between the ligand and the protein, and then also the strength of those bonds. So in general, um, ionic bonds are gonna be stronger than, uh, what do we have? H bonds or van der Waals interactions. So um, a ligand and a protein that have more ionic bonds are gonna be, have a stronger affinity for each other than ones that only have like van der Waals uh, interactions. Um, and then remember how Professor talked about the Goldilocks hypothesis, which where most proteins want a moderate affinity for their ligands because if they don't have a high enough affinity, then the interaction won't even occur. Um, and if the affinity is too high, then the ligand will be stuck in the binding site for like a, an amount of time that's not useful for the process the cell needs uh, this interaction for, and the cell doesn't wanna be stuck. So a way that we quantify affinity is using the dissociation constant, which is KD. Um, and this in general quantifies the strength of the protein ligand interaction because it shows the rate of dissociation of the protein ligand complex within the cell. So um, the higher the KD is actually, the faster, more likely a ligand is to dissociate from its protein. Um, so KT's, KD's qual quantity has an inverse, um, inverse relationship with affinity. So the higher your quantity of KD, the lower the affinity is for the uh, ligand and the protein. And you can see that by looking at the oh my God, equation here. Um, P is protein uh, concentration, L is ligand concentration, and C is the concentration between of complexes, so of protein ligand complexes. So if there's more proteins and ligands um, diffusing around the cell not in complex, then that'll be a large, KD will be a larger number. But if there's more complexes, then um, that KD will be a smaller number. So that shows how a smaller KD will, will, will means there's a higher affinity because there's more complexes at any given time. Um, okay. Any questions about KD and ligand protein interaction? Okay, moving on to protein trafficking. So this is just an overview of protein trafficking. Essentially in eukaryotic cells, um, mRNA is trafficked out of the nucleus after it's been uh, transcribed. And then the proteins are made in the cytosol by the ribosomes. So the ribosomes in the cytosol are either freely moving around in the cytosol or they can be docked on um, the rough ER. Um, ribosomes, um, when proteins are meant to be trafficked into the endomembrane system, uh, they are synthesized and translated by ribosomes that lie on the rough ER membrane. Um, these proteins in the endomembrane system are entering any membrane-bound organelles within the cell, so they're destined for either the ER, the Golgi, lysosomes, vesicles that are going to leave the cell or to be on um, the cell membrane. And then proteins that are not being trafficked into the endomembrane system will be made by ribosomes that are freely floating around in the cytosol, so that will include any proteins that just stay in the cytosol, any proteins that go to the mitochondria, and any proteins that are going to the nucleus. Any questions? Okay. So this is just an image that shows in general um, how free ribosomes are working in the cell, in the cytosol. So those will just synthesize and the protein will gain its tertiary structure in the cytosol and then be trafficked to where it needs to go. Whereas for, um, things that are entering the en endomembrane system. They will, um, the, our, the ribosome will dock on the um, membrane of the ER and then the protein will then be trafficked to other points in the system. So this is a closer look at the endomembrane system. Um, so essentially it's a group of membrane bound organelles that will modify, package and transport the protein. So like I said, that includes the ER, the Golgi, the lysosome, the cell membrane and transport vesicles that move between them. Um, this is also called the secretory pathway, just the movement of proteins from the ER to the Golgi and then to other places within the endomembrane system. Um, the movement of proteins through the endomembrane system begins in the ER, and then from here, vesicles will split off and go to the Golgi. Proteins can be modified at the Golgi and then will move from the Golgi and vesicles. Um, and so here we're thinking about protein localization sequences. If a protein only has an ER localization sequence, it will go through the entire um, secretory pathway and end up exiting the cell. 
for the protein to stay within the ER or within the cell elsewhere. It needs different um, localization sequences. So now we're looking at specifically at protein localization sig signal sequences. So these determine where proteins are trafficked after they have been folded into their tertiary structure, or not sometimes, but they determine in general where proteins are being trafficked to. Um, so these signal sequences are essentially just a stretch of amino acids that are embedded on the primary structure of the protein. It's part of the polypeptide chain. It's not something that's added to the protein after it's been um, transcribed. Um, so the sequence, yeah. So it's made by the ribosome. Um, and the string of amino acids is like a unique address that tells the protein where it needs to go. So when a protein is localized to the ER, it has the ER signal sequence, which is also called the ER import sequence. Um, this import sequence is recognized by the SRP, which is the signal recognition particle. Um, and that binds to the synthesizing protein and brings it. So what's happening essentially is as the protein is being synthesized by the ribosome, the end terminus comes out first. And at the very end terminus, that's where the import signal sequence is. So the SRP will bind to that ER import signal sequence and bring the ribosome along with the protein that's being currently transcribed and bring it to the membrane of the ER. And so at the membrane here, the, as the protein is synthesized, it will be pulled into the lumen of the ER via, it'll just go through a pore um, in the surface of the ER. And then once it is in the lumen of the ER in its primary form, the signal sequence, the local, ER localization sequence will be cleaved off and the protein with the help of chaperone proteins will be folded into its tertiary or maybe quaternary structure. Um, and if the protein does not have an import sequence, it'll just be synthesized in the cytosol and either stay there or go wherever it needs to go. Um, and once they enter the ER, it cannot leave the lumen of the endomembrane system um, as the signal sequence is cleaved off. Okay, so it's not loading, but this um, slide has a linked video of an ER signal, of an ER import. Um, and it's really helpful to visualize what I just explained. So if you guys want to, oh, there we go. Yeah, so we're not going to watch, there's something else. Yeah, you guys can just watch it on your own. Um, but so that explains what I just explained and it gives a good visual of how it's happening. Just when you're watching it, don't worry about the GTP SRP receptor interactions because we didn't learn about those in class and that's not, we're not going that in depth on the exam. Um, okay. So this is just more in depth on signal sequences. Um, so typically, like I said, proteins will enter the organelles unfolded when they're being localized to the endomembrane system via the ER um, or enter when they're entering the mitochondria. So essentially proteins are only being trafficked in their tertiary structure when they're entering the nucleus. Um, and that is because the localization sequence for proteins that are destined for the nucleus um, ends up on the outside of the tertiary structure and it's recognized by important, which we'll go over later. Um, so yeah, proteins will enter the nucleus fully folded. Um, Signal in that case, the signal sequence is able to bind act as a binding site for another protein to latch onto the protein and bring it um, to where it needs to be localized. Um, yeah, and so remember about the nuclear localization sequences that's not on the end terminus like it usually is for the endomembrane system or for the mitochondria. Um, any question? I am probably wrong about that. Yes, but the process in general is similar where the um, primary structure will be brought to a pore at the mitochondria surface and be fed through the pore and then the tertiary structure is made in there. I'm not sure which, um, which end is on to be honest. So here's another video. This video might honestly show up. But this video is also linked about the specifics of mitochondrial localization. No, it's only end terminus. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, similar to the ER, the end terminus will be brought to the pore and then it'll be fed through that pore right here to get into the lumen of the mitochondria. That's just a different sequence than the ER since the mitochondria is not a part of the endomembrane system. Um, okay. 
This is a chart that just shows the similarities and differences between signal sequences. So in general, for the nucleus, the signal sequence will stay on the protein at all times, whereas um, for the ER, the signal sequence will be cleaved off at entry, as well as the mitochondria. Um, yeah, so this is basically going over everything I just covered. If you guys want to go back and look at it, it's a good like synthesis of all the information. Um, and then this is specific types of signal sequences. So there's a signal sequence of, you don't have to know the exact amino acid sequence of every signal sequence, just know like the general traits of it. So for example, for the ER import, that is at the end terminus and it's a long string of hydrophobic amino acids. So if she were to say, what if we change that to um, hydrophilic amino acids? And then you could say then it wouldn't work anymore. Um, so it's hydrophobic amino acids followed by interspersed polar. Interspersed charge R groups after that. Um, and the SRP, like I said, the signal retention seek protein binds to this and transports it to the ER. Then there's ER retention sequence. I mentioned earlier that um, the ER import sequence will bring it to the ER, but if you want the protein to stay in the ER and not go through the secretory pathway, you also need a retention sequence. So this is what's at the C-terminus. Um, and after the entire protein has been synthesized by the ribosome, that sort of tells the cell that the protein is going to stay and work in the ER. So if there's just an ER import, it will not stay in the ER. So for import into the nucleus, we need the NLS, which is the nuclear localization signal sequence. This is where important will bind. Um, we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, and this signal sequence, like I said, is on the outer part of the tertiary protein. And then for export from nucleus, the cell uh, protein would need the NES, which is the nuclear export signal sequence. This is where export binds. That's also on the surface of the folded protein. And if the protein is meant to be produced in the cytosol and then simply stay in the cytosol, there is no um, signal sequence on the protein. Any questions about that? Okay. Okay, so nuclear import and export. Uh, we struggled on this on the exam this was on, which is why I put the, haha, I don't get it name. Um, but you're going to get it after this review session. We're going to do it. It's going to be awesome. Okay. So nuclear import and export. We are looking at gifts and gaps. So these are very important to regulate RAN. And these are a bunch of words. So let's break it down. A gap is a GTPase activating protein. So what does a GTPase do? It hydrolyzes GTP to GDP. Um, and that's right on the slides. I should read my next slide. Good answer. Um, <laughs> so GTPase hydrolyzes GTP on its own, but it's a really bad enzyme. It doesn't do its job very efficiently. So a gap is a GTPase activating protein. So it, activated, it activates it in that it increases the rate at which GTPase activity occurs. So um, makes GTPase inactive, does its job on the side as well. I'm not sure the order of these bullet points. One second. I did this yesterday and I confused myself. So skip those two bullet points. I'll come back to that. Um, so GAP is needed for RAN GTPase to release exporting and important. Oh, so when GTPase or a GTPase is bound, um, to GTP, it's active and doing its job, right? So when we have gap on it, it hydrolyzes, which then makes the GTPase inactive because it can't do its job without GTP. And this happens in the cytosol. That's what that point means. Um, and the end result of this is RAN is gonna end up bound to GDP instead of GTP. Um, and I have the figures, so we'll go through that. Also, one thing she likes to ask is, um, is GAP itself an enzyme? And the answer is no. The GTPase is what's the enzyme, but GAP just 
I'll speak to the end and end function there. For those of you on Zoom, if you didn't hear that, GAP is not an enzyme. It just helps the enzyme be a better enzyme. She said it more eloquently though. <laughs> so yeah, GAP is needed for RAN GTPase to release exportin and important in the cytosol. So it's used in both import and export, which we'll see. Um, important is importing, exporting is exporting. Um, yeah. So GAFs are guanine exchange factors, um, not exchanging, but yeah. So it binds RAN GDP, and its job essentially is to exchange a GDP for a GTP. So while a GTP can be hydrolyzed into a GDP, we cannot, in this process, go backwards. We're not adding a phosphate. We are taking out the GDP, and we are bringing in a GTP because the affinity between RAN and GTP is significantly higher than the affinity between RAN and GDP. I, mean, I don't know if it's significantly higher, um, but the levels of GTP are significantly higher just floating around. So GTP comes into the binding pocket of RAN. So that's what a GEF does. A GEF takes out the GDP. Well, technically, it binds RAN and changes conformation so that RAN releases GDP. It doesn't actively take it out, but it causes a conformation in RAN so that it releases its GDP so GTP can come into the binding pocket. Um, when RAN, RAN is bound to GTP, it changes conformations again. Um, and when it changes conformations, it no longer has good affinity for your GEF. So that dissociates. So GEF does not stay bound. Um, and then RAN GTP can do its function, which we will get into. Um, RAN is needed for, or GEF is needed for RAN to bind GTP. Um, and that's important because we need GTP to um, remove important from the cargo protein in nuclear X import. And um, GEF is needed for RAN GTPase, RAN GTP to bind exportin and the cargo protein in export. And I know this is a lot of words, but I the pictures, we'll get to the pictures. Um, so here's a little schematic that we have RAN bound to GTP. And we know that that's active, indicated here by the little like lines, right? Like a sun. Um, and then GAP comes in and it hydrolyzes and this phosphate turns it from guanine triphosphate to guanine diphosphate. So now we, it's RAN bound to GDP, it's inactive, but GAF can come in, change the conformation of RAN so that GDP dissociates. GTP is 10 times higher in concentration in the cell, so that yeets in, and then we have RAN GTP. Um, so the process of nuclear export, now knowing what those things are, sorry, I'm moving this so I can see. Can you see this? Oh, I can just make it go away. Okay, cool. So nuclear import, this schematic is your best friend in this. So step one is down here. We have important. Important is a protein and it binds our cargo protein that has a nuclear localization sequence. So that's our NLS. So important binds that and then it is a bound complex. When it is bound to important, it can enter the nucleus through a nuclear pore complex. Important can go through when bound to cargo. When we go into the nucleus, so purple is nucleus, this is cytosol, it's also labeled for anyone if you have trouble with colors or colorblind, um, they're also labeled here, nucleus and cytosol, so um, pay attention to that. So step three, our RAN G, we have RAN GDP in here. So we can see that GEF comes in and um, this is saying that it likes, doesn't turn it from GTP to GDP, but it swaps it. So we bring in the GTP and push out the GDP. And I know that's kind of confusing. It looks like it's turning it into GDP, but the GTP is coming in, pushing out the GDP and we activate RAN. RAN then binds important and that changes conformation because anytime things bind, they change conformation. And uh, that 
makes it release the cargo protein into the nucleus. Um, and that's what we wanted because we wanted our cargo to go into the nucleus. That's why we had an NLS. So then we have RAN GTP bound to important and that goes through a complex to exit the nucleus. So when we have RAN GTP, it stays bound to important. It has good infinity. So we need GAT to come in to make the GTPase go do its function better, right? To hydrolyze. So GAP comes in so that RAN GTPase can hydrolyze to GDP. And then it has bad affinity for important and let's go of important. And now important can be used again to import. Um, and this is really important because if we don't have GAP, then it's gonna take a really, really long time for RAN to hydrolyze. And so a bunch of importants are gonna stay stuck to RAN. Um, and we're not gonna have import at the level that we had if we're gonna have it at all. So it might still happen just at a way, way slower rate. So RAN, just as Melissa said, RAN is our enzyme here. GAP is not the enzyme. GAP is just helping RAN be its best self. Um, any questions on import before we go to export? Yes. Okay, so the question was, if, for example, you've had questions on GAP and GAF and if they're not working. So in the case of X, import, we'll do first. So in the case of import, if GAF is not working, let's say, so we broke a GAF. So we have a bunch of RAN GDP, right? We are not, in the case of import, you see that GAF comes in to activate RAN essentially, right? So if you start at step one, Important can still bind and we can still get into the nucleus, correct? GAF does not affect that. But now we have low, if any, levels of RAN GTP. So there's gonna be a lot of times now that the cargo and important stay bound. So they're hanging out here. So the cargo gets in, it's not released, so it probably can't do its job, but we won't focus on that. Um, but it's not binding important. So important starts to build up in the nucleus because to leave the nucleus, it needs to be bound to RAN GTP. So if we have a bunch of important in the nucleus, that means we have lower levels in the cytosol. So import overall is going to slow down and possibly stop, um, depending on the cell's reaction to that, which we do not know. Um, now, if GAP was not working, we start at one and we see that we can get all the way through RAN GTP coming out to the cytosol, correct? Does that make sense? Because all of that's still working. But now GAP is broken. So RAN GTP is still bound important to important and it's gonna hydrolyze significantly slower than it would, which means important is going to stay bound to RAN GTP. So it's not going to be available to bring more cargo inside to, or in the nucleus. Now it still works as a GTPA, so it's slower. So I wouldn't necessarily say import's gonna stop completely. This is me hypothesizing. This is how I would answer the question. I don't think it's gonna stop completely because it's gonna happen just at a much slower rate. Um, so I would say that import is gonna significantly decrease in rate. If in this case, gap is not working. Does that make sense? How to kind of work through those problems? How I kind of started. Yeah. Anything that you got on the past exams, I believe I'm 99% sure you're going to get them again. You're going to get the amino acids. You're going to get your import. You're going to get your export. What else did you guys get? Anything? So you're going to get your amino acids and your import export. So you will have this exact schematic. Okay. Any other questions before we move on to export? So export has a lot of the same players. Um, so, but instead we start in the nucleus, okay? So we have some sort of protein here that has a nuclear export sequence as Melissa talked about. Um, and so step number one in this case is that we need our GAF to come and uh, switch RAN GTP or no, um, sorry. That was just my innate reaction to that. Um, so GAF comes in 
changes the conformation of RAN, GDP dissociates, GTP comes in. When RAN is active in this case, it can bind exportin. So it binds exportin with good affinity, much like how it bound important. But in this case of exportin, when we bind it, exportin kind of changes conformation so that it can now bind a nuclear export signal. So we end up with this RAN GTP exportin nuclear export or protein that's to be exported kind of complex here. And once we have that, we can leave the nucleus. So we leave the nucleus and mm, this time the only big difference here is we have a protein bound, right? Because we had RAN GTP with important or import uh, nuclear import. In this case, now we have the protein that we're bringing out. So GAP is gonna come in and again, help RAN be its best self, help RAN hydrolyze quicker to release um, the exportin. And remember when exportin was not bound to RAN GTP, it had, it, it was not able to bind the export sequence. So as soon as RAN GTP, P turns to RAN GDP, it releases exportin, exportin changes conformation, releases our, releases our cargo, and our exportin goes back into the nucleus to go pick up more cargo. So in this case, if GEF is not working, we don't have RAN GTP again, so we cannot bind exportin. If we cannot bind exportin, exportin cannot bind our protein that is meant to leave. It cannot bind the nuclear export sequence. So we're gonna have a bunch of exportin in here, not bound to our cargo. So we are not going to get export. Does that make sense? So if we have GEF working, but not GAP, we can get out into the cytosol, but RAN GTP is going to stay bound for a longer period of time because it's not being a very good enzyme. So eventually RAN will hydrolyze and become RAN GDP. It will release our exportin and our protein, but it's gonna happen at a much, much slower rate. So exportin or exporting will be significantly slower because the exportin, not because we're not releasing the cargo necessarily, because I'm not sure how we're quantifying that, but we do know that the exportin will be spending more time outside in the cytosol. So it's not in the nucleus to pick up cargo. So it's going to take longer for there to be an available exportin to go pick up the cargo. Does that make sense? So essentially, anytime you break GEF or GAP, you're pretty much slowing down or stopping the process. Um, and you just gotta say why. Um, and it's more likely that GEF will completely break the process than GAP because GAP is not, there's enzymatic activity that GAP is just helping. So the enzymatic activity, unless we break RAN G, the GP, GTPase activity, um, that's still gonna happen just a lot slower. Does that make sense? Are we good on import and export now? Does it kind of, did that help kind of how to, go through the process of answering those questions so that we can all get 100% on them as I'm on your team, for sure. I was there, I was there. <laughs> okay, and now we're gonna do gene expression and regulation in eukaryotes. <laughs> cool, okay, <laughs> no, one, no one laughs. Okay, so. Okay, so for gene expression and regulation, um, gene expression expression is uh, the production of proteins. So if you express a gene, you make a protein. Um, and this is obviously carefully regulated because there's nothing that happens in a cell that's not carefully regulated because cells are fighting every second of the day to stay alive. Um, so brief overview of the central dogma which if you take anything with Tom Mareska, he will respectfully disagree with this, but for your um, knowledge, in eukaryotes, we have DNA or DNA goes to RNA, goes to protein. That is what you need to, that is 
widely regarded as the central dogma of biology of cells of I'm not sure the central dogma of what you need to know right now. So in eukaryotes, transcription happens in the nucleus um, and translation happens in the cytosol. In prokaryotes, we don't have a nucleus. So they happen at, in the cytosol at the same time. Um, obviously transcription is happening first and translation is coming after um, because you need the transcription, the, the RNA transcript before you can translate, but they're happening concurrently. Um, so DNA is read by RNA polymerase, which is different than DNA polymerase because you just talked about DNA polymerase in nine and 10, right? To um, replicate DNA. So in this, DNA is read by RNA polymerase to make an mRNA, um, which is one type of RNA. There's lots of them. Um, then the ribosome will read the mRNA and to make an amino acid sequence, which ends up being your polypeptide. Um, and that's translation. And then your protein folding occurs. And that's your R group interactions um, that we talked about earlier. So there's many, many, many types of regulation. Um, and this is trying to condense it. So this is transcriptional regulation is your main site of regulation of gene expression. This is where you're mainly doing your regulation, which will probably make sense as to why, because this is a lot more powerful than the other ones when you think about it. So we have two types of transcription factors involved. We have our general transcription factor, which just regulate RNA polymerase binding. If RNA polymerase can't bind DNA, transcription can't occur. Um, regular, regulatory transcription factors are more gene specific and they can be positive or negative. So if it's positive, it's enhancing transcription, which means transcription is happening more. So we're making more protein. Um, and if it's negative, we're suppressing transcription um, when it's bound. So we have chromatin, which is histones, which are proteins wrapped in DNA. Um, and it's packaging determines which genes can be expressed, okay? So if you see, um, euchromatin is the open state. So euchromatin is when RNA polymerase and transcription factors and everything that needs to bind to DNA can come in and actually bind because there's space, um, which means the genes are more easily or more likely to be transcribed versus heterochromatin is the closed state. So these are all really tightly wound, tightly bound together. Um, so all your other things, your RNA polymerase, your transcription factors, everything can't come in to transcribe because they're too, um, it's too tightly packaged. So genes can't be transcribed. So these, your general or your transcription factors and your chromatin packaging or state of chromatin are examples of transcriptional regulation. Does that make sense? And we'll definitely get more into this. We're going to do the trip opera on. Um, then we have RNA modification and processing. Um, so RNA has to be processed to be made into a more stable mRNA. Um, so how do we make it stable is we have our, we get it suited with armor. Um, I will admit I did not make this slide. Um, so we have our 5G cap and our poly A tail. So your 5G tap, cap is guanosine covalently added to the five prime end. So G, 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 G bunch of G's, um, which is why it's called the G prime cap. Um, and it, it protects the RNA um, because now it can't be chewed up by nucleases. And then the poly A tail is on the three prime end and it protects the mRNA from being degraded. And as you can probably imagine, the poly A tail is a bunch of A's. Um, so yeah, so that protects from degradation and it's required for um, export from the nucleus or we're gonna get degraded. Um, so now an example of RNA modification and processing is RNA splicing, which only happens in eukaryotes because prokaryotes don't have introns and extrons. Exons, not extrons, I'm sorry. I'm gonna probably say that like four times. So introns are your non-coding, which is my meme, you know where it said introns, nothing, yeah. So introns are your non-coding regions and we gotta splice those out. 
because they don't do anything and we don't like them. So they are transcribed, but not translated versus exons are, end up being exported is how I remember it. Um, they are the ones that get translated. And the spliceosome is the enzyme that comes in and cuts out the introns. Um, so alternative splicing allows the cells to kind of choose which exons are made into the mRNA transcript. So not all the exons every single time are necessarily in the mRNA. Um, that's how you end up with more diversity um, of proteins from one gene. And that is an example of RNA modification, obviously, because you're going to end up with different mRNA, um, depending on the uh, alternative splicing. Does that make sense? We good on this? Okay, mRNA life and other related things. So mRNA degradation control, um, the stability of mRNA. So we can control mRNA degradation um, and the degradation for specific mRNAs. mRNA localization, the cell can control whether the mRNA gets localized to a new area. So um, such as Peabody's uh, that we talked about in the miRNA pathway, which we will touch on. Um, the mRNA lifespan can be regulated, so we can determine how long the mRNA uh, exists. Um, half-life, you hear about half-lives in drugs, um, so the half-life is how long it takes for it to be half depleted, half yeah. And then we have translational control, which is ribosome binding access. So this is what we talk a lot about for the trip operon. Um, so a protein can block RNA or ribosome binding, or it can be necessary for the ribosome to bind. Um, so we'll do some examples of that. And then we have some post-translational controls. So we have allosteric um, post-translational modifications, which are covalently adding or removing uh, phosphates, acetyl groups, methyl groups. We can ubiquitinate, right, to have it degraded. Um, and then nucleotide binding. So like we talk about GTP and GDP or ATP and ADP um, can change the behavior of certain proteins. Um, like GTP can activate and GDP can inactivate like you saw in import and export. And then protein degradation, we have the UPR pathway and ubiquitin mediated proteolysis where the protein is tagged with ubiquitin and sent to the proteasome. Um, here's a fun little schematic for eukaryotes. Um, and it shows all the little steps where all this stuff is happening. And then in prokaryotes, um, there's different levels of chromatin control because they don't have a nucleus. Um, RNA processing, obviously we're not doing alternative splicing or anything because we don't even have introns um, and we're translating at the same time. So we don't need to process the RNA. Um, and then mRNA transport and localization, we don't do that in prokaryotes because there's no nucleus. Um, so it's kind of weird that they show the nucleus in the cytosol in the prokaryote, you know what I'm saying? It's all happening in the cytosol. So that's, I don't want that to throw everyone off. It's just a comparison. So here's some similarities and differences. Um, so in prokaryotes, um, in eukaryotes, your mRNA makes one protein versus prokaryotes, mRNA is polycystronic, which means one gene can make multiple proteins. Um, like an operon, right? And then difference, uh, another difference is that DNA is packaged in eukaryotes, not in prokaryotes. Uh, no nuclear export in prokaryotes. Um, and then your transcription factors in eukaryotes are basal transcription factors and prokaryotes have the sigma factor, which is the lima bean, which is one of my favorite proteins. Sigma 70 is a big one. And then there's all the similarity. I'm not gonna keep reading this off. You can see the chart. Um, Sigma 70, look at that, Sigma 70. It's almost like I made these slides. Um, so Sigma 70 is my little lima bean and it's uh, proteins 
or the sigma 70s are proteins that help bind RNA polymerase to the promoter. Remember, sigmas are in prokaryotes. So this binds at the negative 35 box and the negative 10 box. So one would be where we actually start transcription. Negative 10 would be 10 nucleotides back. Negative 35 would be 35 nucleotides back. These places have more A and T base pairs because A and T base pairs only have two bonds while C and Gs have three bonds. So they're easier to break. Um, and sigma 70 is sequence specific, meaning that there's a consensus sequence. So it's kind of a best match. So consensus sequence, if you remember, it's not all the same, but they're all very similar. So um, they are, it is sequence specific. So the sequence just has to be similar enough um, to the consensus sequence. Um, and it combines different sequences, obviously, right? Because it's a consensus sequence kind of situation. So the affinity can change. So some, um, some genes, some promoters, are gonna have a stronger affinity. First, or sigma 70 will have a stronger affinity. So there's gonna be a lot more transcription. And then we have the trip operon. No, okay. Um, so operons are um, DNA sequences that have one promoter for multiple um, genes. So the operator, we have the operator right here is the O. That's where your repressor binds. We have our P, which is our promoter region. That's where RNA polymerase binds. We have an activator back here. Um, and then we have our genes. So operons are inducible and or, or repressible. So inducible means that they're usually off, but we can induce it to, uh, we can turn it on or repressible, which means it's regularly on, but we can turn it off. The trip operon is a repressible operon, which means it's normally on and we need a repressor to turn it off. So the trip operon is tryptophan. It's an amino acid. Low levels of tryptophan mean that bacteria don't have access to tryptophan and we need to make more. So we want our trip genes on. At high levels, we have tryptophan and making it would be a waste of energy. So we want to turn off the operon because we don't want to waste energy because like I was saying, and I'm not kidding, your cells genuinely are fighting to stay alive at every second. So they're trying to be as efficient as they can. Um, so the trip repressor is a negative regulator, right? Because the repressor makes less transcription happen. Um, there's a video display of the trip operon if you're a video learner, but we already are over an hour and I know you're starting to probably fade. So you can watch that on your own time if you're interested. Here's a little diagram. We have all of our trip genes. And the important thing about these genes is that you make your polypeptides um, and you use all of them to make tryptophan, which is kind of why the operon is a good thing. And we only have operons in prokaryotes. Um, so you make all the genes at once that you need to make a tryptophan. Um, and then we have the attenuator sequence. This is a very simplified version of the attenuator sequence. Tryptophan repressor is a little Pac-Man and tryptophan is it's a piece of cheese it's missing in this case. So when there is tryptophan, it binds the repressor, it activates the repressor and the repressor binds the operator and represses. So when there's tryptophan, we're repressed. When there's not, we're not. So scenario number one is high levels of tryptophan, which means that tryptophan is bound. It's a co-repressor in this case. It's bound. So we bind the operator because our repressor is active. RNA polymerase can't bind because physically the repressor, you can see well in this one, is taking up space so that the, or the polymerase cannot bind, okay? So there's no transcription. And attenuation, <laughs> I'm gonna do the scenarios and I'm gonna go back to the attenuation. So in low levels of tryptophan, there's no co-repressor to activate the repressor. So we don't bind and now RNA polymerase, or we don't bind the operator. So now RNA polymerase can come in and start transcription. No attenuation. Um, and like I said, I'm gonna go back to attenuation because I think it makes more sense. So 
not okay low to high which is medium levels initially the trip to fan is not bound to the repressor um so the repressor is inactive which means that we're making tryptophan um later the cell will realize we have enough tryptophan because we've made it and this is kind of this case where we'll have attenuation so now i'll go back to attenuation so attenuation is early termination of transcription attenuation happens when we start to make tryptophan and then we realize that we don't want to waste the effort to continue to make it because we have enough so the attenuation sequence is before the DNA that actually codes for tryptophan. So it's before any of the genes. And there's four regions, one, two, three, and four. One and two are complementary, three and four are complementary, and two and three are also complementary. So prokaryotes attenuate because they can transcribe and translate simultaneously. So if you realize that you don't want to be transcribing, this is the best way to stop before you translate. Translate. So the mechanism of tryptophan is that your RNA polymerase is hanging out, going, right? And then there, so here's your start codon, here's your trip codons, and here's one, two, three, four, right? So we have a pause for one and two. Right? Do we remember that there's a pause? Um, I think that this is now. Is this the mechanism? Yes. Yeah. So we've transcribed. Now we're translating. So the ribosome comes around, and one and two pause to let the ribosome catch up to the RNA polymerase. Right. So it'll pause. This is not, I don't have the picture I like, I'm sorry. Um, so if it pauses and gets stuck, one and two, or if it doesn't get stuck. So when it's paused, it's paused over the one region, okay? So it's paused over this region, which then means two is continuing to get transcribed and cannot hairpin with one. So it's continuing to be paused. It's waiting for tryptophan to come in to tell it to stop pausing. Three is made before it's all the way off of one. So two and three are complementary. They can hairpin. So our ribosome is still chilling here. So two and three hairpin. And then it keeps going. So two and three have hairpinned, and by the time four is made, they're still hairpinned. So three can't hairpin with four. And we like that, and we keep going. The issue is, if we get off of one in time for it to hairpin with two. So if one and two hairpin, that means we had enough tryptophan in the cell. So tryptophan came in, and we just kept the ribosome going. It didn't have to pause, it just kept going because we have enough tryptophan. If we have enough tryptophan, remember we don't wanna make more. So we had enough tryptophan and it didn't pause. So one and two got to hairpin, which means those are hairpinned and we make three and four. Since two is hairpinned with one, it can't hairpin with three, which means three is then free to hairpin with four. So one and two are hairpinned. In this case, two and three are not hairpinned and then three and four hairpin. When three and four hairpin, it mechanically, physically rips the sequence, the mRNA, out of the RNA polymerase. Effectively, huh? No, sorry. RNA polymerase, uh, you yank it out, and then you just have like this little segment of like weirdness. Um, that just gets degraded. Um, that's hard. I don't know if I have any more slides or a better. Yeah, so here's a good summary since I was just talking at you. I would highly recommend looking at attenuation videos if you're still struggling. Um, and Melissa has a good one that she's gonna send and I'll send it out in an email with the slides. But yeah, at high levels, no initiation. At low levels, three and four, uh, oh, at low levels, 
two and three are going to hairpin because we don't have enough tryptophan at initially low levels to high levels. So we're in that media area, medium area, we're going to attenuate some of the time. Um, and so that's when the three, four hairpin happens. Okay. And now we have RNA interference. Okay, so this is our last topic of the review. So RNA interference is essentially um, one of the functions that helps to regulate um, mRNA degradation or just stop um, translation of mRNA. So if there are any genes that are being produced either by the genome that the cell doesn't want, or if there's any mRNA transcripts being produced by the genome, the cell doesn't want, or if there's any mRNA transcripts being produced by like viral DNA that the cell doesn't want, this is a way for the cell to degrade that RNA. Okay, so like I said, the main idea is this is a sequence specific suppression of gene expression by using double stranded RNA. Um, so the RNAi is the process that will either result in complete degradation of the R mRNAs or it will result in sequestration of the RNAs to stop um, translation and to cause peptide change. So this relies on the risk, which is the um, RNA-induced silencing complex. Um, and this is a multi-protein complex um, that includes a protein called Argonaut, which is often shortened to AGO when we uh, read about it. So AGO specifically is the enzymatic pro portion of the risk complex. And this is what um, is responsible for actually cutting up the nucleic acids of the mRNAs that the risk complex will encounter and, and, and degrade. Um, and so an overview of this process is risk will bind to a small guide RNA and we'll use that guide RNA to then target other mRNAs within the cell using um, base, base pairing complementarity. Um, so in general for this process, it's important to remember that RNA can form something called hairpin loop, which we talked about in the trip operon. Um, because those hair, small hairpin loops are a part of the process of using double-stranded RNA as a target. Um, so we've learned about two different types of pathways within RNAi, one that involves siRNA and one that involves microRNAs, which are usually shortened to miRNAs. And don't get miRNAs and mRNAs confused because a lot of, I graded that question on the second test. And a lot of times people were getting mRNA and miRNAs confused and when they were writing the answer. Um, so the response is a little different based on where the, R M, the guide RNA has come from that our body wants to silence. Um, if we want to silence genes in our own genome and work within our own genome, we're using the microRNA process because the, um, the guide RNA comes from our own genome. Whereas with siRNA, the guide RNA comes from exogenous DNA. So that, that can be from like viral DNA. Um, and in general, the pathway with siRNA more typically will lead to degradation of target mRNAs, whereas the process with miRNA will lead to sequestration to, for translational repression. So this is the diagram for miRNA. So remember, this is starting in the nucleus because it starts with an endogenous guide strand. So um, it starts with the DNA will transcribe pri, pri RNA. PRI miRNA, it's spelled P-R-I miRNA, that's not shown on here. So the PRI miRNA will then get um, processed by Drosha, which is an enzyme within the nucleus. Um, and that will just cut the PRI miRNA and it becomes pre-miRNA. You don't have to know exactly what it does. And then with the help of exportin, the pre-miRNA will exit the nucleus and into the cytoplasm. And once we're in the cytoplasm, the pre-miRNA will be processed by Dicer which is another enzyme, I believe it's an exonuclease. And what this does is it cuts up the long hairpin of the double-stranded um, pre-miRNA. It will cut it up into these short little duplexes. These typically are about 20 to 25 base pairs long. And this is what these duplexes are what the risk complex will um, go around the cell and pick up. And when the cell picks up the risk complex, it unwinds the duplex. And it chooses one of the strands to be its guide strand. And then the other strand, it will just um, get rid of and degrade. And that's called the passenger strand. And so now this, the risk complex with the guide strand of miRNA will go around the cell um, and look for complementary base pair pieces of mRNA throughout the cell. 
So this typically has two end results. The more common one is that there's imperfect binding. And now imperfect complementary binding leads to translational, translational repression. So the targeted mRNAs will be sequestered to the P bodies within the cell, or they can be kept or then eventually degraded, but it's just not initial degradation. So that process is called translational re repression. But um, if there is exact base pairing between the guide strand and the target mRNA strand, then the strand will just be immediately degraded by argonaut. Um, and the reason for that is the imperfect base pairing allows one guide strand to target multiple different pieces of mRNA throughout the cell. Any questions about the mRNA process? mRNA mm -hmm. process. I think even I get confused. You might think that. <laughs> okay, so now we're moving on to siRNA. And the processes are, are very similar, but we're starting in the cytoplasm because the guide strands are not coming from our own cells. They're coming from ex exogenous, oh my God, exogenous sources. Okay, so like I said, we're starting in the cytoplasm. This is also beginning with double-stranded RNA. So it's called either dsRNA or SH means short hairpin RNA. That's just another name for it. So these pieces of RNA have come from something that's not the cell like viral RNA. So the SI RNA will then be cleaved by um, DICER again, so similar to the miRNA pathway, and that will form the duplexes that are about 20 to 25 base pairs long. Those also are unwound by risk. One guide strand is chosen, one passenger strand is degraded, and then this goes and goes around the cell looking for mRNAs that are bound complementary to degrade as well. This more commonly will use um, exact base pairing and that will lead to the cleavage of the mRNA with the argonaut subunit of risk. So the siRNA pathway is the one that more commonly leads to just complete degradation of mRNAs rather than um, sequestration. So why doesn't risk just grab a single strand of um, RNA? So one of the reasons is that um, single-stranded RNA is not very stable and the cell's environment is fairly hostile. So single-stranded RNA, if you need that as a guide strand, it's gonna get degraded in the cell a lot quicker than double-stranded RNA and that's not gonna be useful. The risk won't even have time to pick it up. So then it won't be able to um, go down the downstream events of the pathway. Um, another reason is that the physical process of risk um, picking up the duplex and choosing the guide strand um, is vital to the pathways functioning. So risk sort of needs to be selecting a guide strand to then be doing its job. Um, it wouldn't really be able to recognize just a single strand of RNA floating around in the cytosol of the cell. Um, so this is basically a chart of the differences between miRNA and siRNA. So just going over what I just went over. Any questions? Okay. I think that's it. Yep. That's it. Okay. Okay. Any? General questions? Is there anything on the chat? Anything? Should we do should we just do such a good job of explaining? No chat. Oh yeah. Except one. Yeah, there's no chat. Okay. No. Oh everyone, I just want you to know everyone loves you too. Like we don't need to talk about it, it's fine. Okay. Um, if there's no questions, feel free to end it. Let's go. End it.